Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Thank you for joining us for this special episode. We are looking at Palm Sunday today, yes. the first day of Holy Week. Yeah. And Seth, why should everyone listening really care about Palm Sunday? Well, Palm Sunday remembers the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem riding on a donkey as a rival king to Caesar and the Roman Empire. And I feel like that, saying that just that way, put more stakes on this moment mm -hmm. that I've experienced growing up. I was like, oh, Really? He's coming in as a rival king yeah. to the Roman Empire? Okay. Yeah. That is high high stakes. Yeah. Okay. I have so many questions about that yes. because you changed my opinion about this text. Okay. Uh, and so I have lots of questions. Yes, yes. But get me into this moment. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. what's Jesus been up to to this point? And mm -hmm. why is he coming into Jerusalem at this time? I love the way that John tells the story. Okay. Because in John's gospel, he only records seven miracles right. by Jesus. And the idea with those seven miracles, they are seven miracles of new creation, bringing life from the dead, symbolic of the type of ministry and life and good news, king, the type of king that he'll mm -hmm. be. He'll be a king that brings life from death. And he's just done his seventh and most climactic miracle, which was raising Lazarus from the dead. And before that, he fed 5,000 people with fish and loaves, yep. he healed a paralytic, he's healed people born blind, he's done a whole bunch of stuff. And so after all these miracles, and at one point, after the feeding of the 5,000, people try to force him to be king. Oh, right. Yeah. Right? So they're so picking up. They're picking up I see. that he is this figure mm -hmm. that can solve their problems with their bellies. They're hungry. Right. And here's a king who's finally feeding us, unlike Rome and Herod. Who and those, take, 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 take. Who take, 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 take. Yeah. He's a different kind of person. Mm. And then almost as if to confirm those messianic expectations, he rides into a donkey. Uh, he right, right. rides into a donkey. <laughs> he rides into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Okay. And that's significant because... Well, hold on. Okay. Before we talk about the donkey. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I need to understand what you've just said. Because yes. you said that Jesus has been doing these miracles um, and two things are being communicated. One mm -hmm. is that he is able to take uh, the small things, the dead things, things that are insignificant, and turn them into mir mir miracles, yeah. life. Yes. So Lazarus from the dead, taking a, a few pieces of food and feeding 5,000 people. Taking just plain water and turning, turning it, into it into delicious wine. wine. Yeah, yes. yeah, the best wine. Yeah. Okay, so he, and what he's doing in there, he's not showing off that he can do miracles per se. Right. He is communicating that God, he is God, works differently. Works differently, and he's come to inaugurate a new creation uh -huh. on the earth that brings life from the death, right. or even life through death. Because most kings, most leaders, they lead maybe through killing. <laughs> they That's lead through right. big things, big palaces, big armies. And Jesus is saying, I can take the small, even the dead things of the earth and create a different kind of kingdom through a different kind of strategy. I think that's fair. And I think, I mean, what is death but the ultimate weapon of empire? Right. To coerce its citizens yeah. to do right yep. or to punish them for doing wrong. And Jesus is saying, I can take the biggest weapon empire has and use it against them. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. And then the second thing you said is maybe, that... Can I say that? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Maybe another way to say it is like, instead of motivating people through the use of the sword, yes, he's motivating people with the promise of life. Mm, and yeah. so Jesus has been doing all these miracles throughout his ministry, proving that his kingship will be built on life, not death. Yes, okay, so Jesus is building his kingdom based on life instead of the threat of death. Uh, and people, the second thing you said is people are picking up on this message he's sending, that he's yeah. this new king of a rival kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so you you said that they're starting to be like, oh, well, if this is the anointed one, the promised yeah. one from the Old Testament, the Messiah, let's grab him yes. and let's make him king by force. Let's let him be king and let right. him take over Rome and fight our fights. Because, I mean, if he can do this with a few pieces of bread, if he could turn water into wine, what? imagine what he could do with all the strength of Israel. What could he do with all the mechanisms of government? Right. Oh, That's we right. could really stick it right. to Rome with this guy on our and side. And significantly, Jesus runs away from that. Right. He runs away from that. And so there's a real sense in which if Jesus would have just continued doing miracles with all this messianic undertone, mm -hmm. he could have lived a happy life. Oh, totally. As a prophet and miracle worker. Right. And it's not until this moment on Palm Sunday that the possibility of a quiet life for Jesus is done. Is done. Yeah. Because when he runs into, when he comes into Jerusalem on a donkey, he's not just saying things in the wilderness, doing random miracles in his hometown. He is confronting the political and the religious establishment of his day and making a rival claim 
to their authority. Mm -hmm. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Okay. Talk to me then about this donkey coming yeah. out of the donkey. Because um, I've always thought, and I feel like I've been taught so many times, uh, that um, Jesus riding in on a donkey was a sign of humility and yeah. lowliness. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, no, this is an act of war as a rival king uh, or something like yeah. that. And I'm like, I've not heard that before. Yeah. So, so walk us through the history and the background that makes you get to that point. Well, basically... Um, this is what King Solomon wrote when he rode into Jerusalem after the temple and the uh, his palaces were built ah. during his coronation ceremony. Yep, um, he wa rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, and he, as this wealthy, magnanimous, wise king, rides in on a donkey. And historically, a donkey was the traditional beast of kings. Mm. It wasn't. Um, a big Clydesdale. Not necessarily. Uh, Clydesdale would have been a war horse. Okay. A, horse a horse was a weapon of war. Yes. So to come in on a donkey is kind of a flex, not a military flex, mm -hmm. but one that says, I'm the king and I know it and I don't have to conquer right. because I know I'm the king. Yeah. So he comes in riding on the traditional beast of kings because he knows what that will signal yes. to the powers that be. Also, he does it to fulfill a prophecy given by Zechariah mm -hmm. in Zechariah chapter 9, where God, through the prophet Zechariah, says that one day my, I will send someone, a king, to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, and he will save God's people. Mm. Okay, so what, what's interesting about that is this, this difference between a war horse and a donkey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, because... Um, to not only is it the traditional beast of kings that like right. when a when a when a dignitary enters a city mm -hmm. on a donkey yeah it is him saying i have authority here that's right um it's also significant that he's repeating the solomon story mm -hmm. uh, after the temple and the palaces are built because he's about to go to the temple mm -hmm. so he's claiming mm -hmm. Sol mm -hmm. Sol solomonic king david israel's authority that's right over this this land in this act but the other thing that's really interesting to me is if he's not on a war horse, if you know, mm -hmm. he's saying that the the battle's already won. That's exactly right. The battle's yet to be fought with the religious establishment, with Rome, with death itself. So you would expect Jesus to be like, "All right, let's go to battle. Let's go to war. Let's get on the war horse. Let's get a, give me the Clydesdale." Which is interesting yeah. because there's another Old Testament story that Jesus is tracking with. It's from Second Kings nine, where King Jehu uh -huh. rides in and purges Israel of all of its idolatry and oh. he kills the Ahabic line, King Ahab and all of his descendants. Yeah. He wipes Israel out of all their idolatry and greed and pride and murder. And what happens when he comes into uh, Jerusalem? People take off their cloaks and he rides in on them. Oh. But Jehu's riding on a horse. So he came in as a war, right. a, 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 a angry warrior yeah, yeah, yeah. against injustice and evil and corruption and the way idolatry he's that's what that's what he's doing yeah but for the cloaks to come back out mm. they expect him to be jehu but he's coming in uh not on the war horse right. he's gonna he's gonna do what jehu does but right. without the war without the war how does mm. that happen right and a, a fun detail i love in the story is that we're told in some of the gospel right by some of the gospel writers that G, the donkey jesus is riding on has never been written before. Mm. And the only time I'm aware of that that is mentioned in scripture is when a sacrifice would be offered on the altar. Oh, I see. Uh, if you're going to offer the sacrifice, it can be, it has to be an animal that has, has never, never been, ridden. been ridden. Never been ridden before. So you can't sacrifice a donkey, but that detail. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> they always want like perfect sacrifices at the right. altar. And it's like, uh, don't give me your Mustang after you've put 250,000 miles on it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So what's interesting then is there are all these messianic expectations. Mm -hmm. There are these warlike expectations. There is this real sense that Jesus is forsaking a life of the peaceful prophet doing miracles in the wilderness and in his hometown. Mm -hmm. And he's going to war, but he's going to war against Jerusalem on the back of an animal that could be sacrificed. Mm. So the reason why I think Jesus is humble is not because because he's riding on a donkey. I see. But because of how he will wage war against the powers that be. Because he's going to do it as a sacrifice. 
That's right. That is interesting. Yeah, man, you brought out a whole lot that I'm just like trying to catch <laughs> on to. So it's like uh, the Jehu thing is interesting, right? Because Jesus is about to ride into the temple and and cleanse the temple. That's right. Which is what Jehu mm-hmm. is doing. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. Yep, and he's going to do that he's tomorrow. Gonna, he's going to yep. do that tomorrow. Yep. That's very cool. Um, uh, so I'm just like trying to track on all these things. Um, but uh, the one thing that I want to I want to hear from you now on is what the people are saying. We talked about what they're doing. Mm-hmm. They're laying down their cloaks. And palm branches. And palm branches. Okay, before we get to what they're saying, talk about, it's called Palm Sunday. That's right. That's What's right. the deal with the palm branches? Um, during several feasts mm-hmm. in the Jewish calendar, you would hold something called a lulav. A lulav. Well, that's what they call it now. I don't know if that's oh, what they called it back then. I have a lufa. Is a, that the same thing? Not the same thing. <laughs> uh, but it's basically a palm branch with some citrus fruits on it, traditionally. Okay. And you would wave it as pilgrims would come in to worship at the temple. I see. So all, during these temple festivals, people would wave these palm branches, and they would sing from the Psalms their pilgrimage songs on the way to the temple. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times on Palm Sunday, people quote the really famous line, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King of Israel. Mm-hmm. And they're singing this over Jesus as they're waving palm, palm branches and laying their cloaks down. So it's really significant. The, yeah. crowd is, the crowd is saying, Hosanna, which means save us. Save us, Lord, we pray. Yeah, Lord, we pray. Blessed is the king of Israel. Yeah, They're making a very public declaration that he is a rival king to the powers that be, mixing it with all the hopes of the Jewish festivals yeah. in which pilgrims would come to the temple to offer sacrifices mm-hmm. and claiming that Jesus is the one who's going to make it all work out somehow. Jesus is the one who's going to save them who's going to be the the one who inhabits the temple, yes. who fulfills all the hopes of their feasts. That's right. They're, and and I, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm just, I'm just blowing me away. Like How much is going on right here? Yeah, yeah. well, that and how fickle this crowd is, is going to be. Right. Yeah. I, it is not clear yeah. how much this crowd understands of the deeper significance that's happening. The way that Mark tells the story, oh. it's almost as if they're treating Jesus as just another pilgrim. Because everybody would be singing these songs on the way to Jerusalem. Oh my goodness, you're right. I've never thought about. Th- I was yeah. like, why are they here? How did they get? You? Did, did Jesus like send out a tweet? Right, you know, right, and like, right, he's right. like, hey, babe, meet me on the road. I'll be That's on the donkey. Right. Bring your palm branches. No. You know, it's like, how did he orchestrate this event? It's like, man, we are the week of Passover. Yeah, Jerusalem would have been rammed with people. That's right. They would have been going through all of these feasts and preparations and welcoming pilgrims coming in from all over the world to come to the temple and offer their sacrifices to participate in Passover. And Jesus is just in the line of all the pilgrims. Right. And and it's just the celebrations happening around him. Right. And they don't even realize that they are speaking Yes. These prophetic words over Jesus mm-hmm. as the final pilgrim, the final Davidic yeah. king, the final one to arrive for Passover. That's blowing my mind. I've never yeah. thought of that before. Yes. It, we, we don't know the full state of the crowd. Sure. Some probably are doing it with all the messianic hopes that we've set up. Yeah. Others are just doing it because everybody else is doing it. Yep. And this is kind of also what you do on Palms this is all, what, on, during Passover. Yeah, that's right. The, he's just another pilgrim. And that's the way when Mark tells the story, when Jesus finally gets to the temple... Nothing happens. Mm. It's a, this really anticlimactic moment. Jesus walks in the temple, looks around, and then, and then goes he, to sleep. He, go, he, goes, he goes back to Bethany. He goes back to Bethany. That's right. Yeah. And so it's it's interesting. Right. But that is all the meaning and significance that this day is carrying. Mm. Jesus is a rival king to Roman power. He's going to build a kingdom based on life rather than the wielding of death. He's going to do so as a sacrifice for his people in fulfillment with the prophecies. And he's doing it in such a way that will guarantee the ire of the religious establishment and Rome forcing his death in the end. Okay. So now you've kind of touched on like, okay, why is all of this good news for us <laughs> right. here? So um, why is Jesus riding in as a rival king? Mm-hmm. Like who's he riding against? What's the purpose of that? Uh, and why is that good news for us today? And Or even for, you know, people of Jesus' day? Yeah, I mean, on... In one sense, like Jesus is coming to disarm and dethrone the evil empires of the world, take away the power of death and replace it with a kingdom of life. Like on the most meta of levels. Right. That's what he's going to come into. And I guess that's coming from the idea, too, that uh, we have to understand the kingship thing that's happening here. Yes. That Israel is without a king. Mm -hmm. They do not have a king. Um, But 
you know, back in, you know, the golden era, yeah. it was David, King David, right. and God made a covenant with him. Mm-hmm. And he said, one of your descendants will sit on your throne forever. That's right. And I will make an eternal kingdom out of him. And there will be yes. peace and equity on all sides. Right. And Israel's not there right now. That's and they've been waiting to mm-hmm. see if God is going to be faithful to that promise or not. That's and so right. for a king to be riding in... Is a, it is a big deal whether people are noticing it's happening or not. Yeah. And so when Jesus is writing in as the new king from David's line, a lot is happening there. Mm-hmm. And it's a threat, as you're saying, to Rome, who mm-hmm. is currently occupying Israel. Right. And overseeing it, taxing it. Yes. Uh, they're like the new Babylon. Right. It's a threat to the religious establishment that you brought right. up. Yeah, right. Caiaphas, the high priest, was elected or given his position by Rome. Uh-huh. The Roman governor gave him that position. So his power among the Jews is related to Rome. Uh huh. And it's going to be the religious establishment that drives mm-hmm. the crucifixion of Jesus. Right. And that's and that's probably two things happening there. You've got uh, kind of one loose group that we could maybe call the Sadducees, mm-hmm. and they've just gone in bed with Rome. They are just completely yeah. Hellenized in the Greek culture. Mm-hmm. You know, They've been basically put there by Roman authorities, and they don't want to see their privileged position ruined right. by some king of the Jews coming and ruining their political relationship, and they would right. lose their sense of power. The Pharisees, on the other, other hand, aren't necessarily as pumped about Rome, but they mm-hmm. want a king who's actually going to come and knock and, like, Bash and, some skulls. And bash some skulls. Do things the way that they think need to be done. Yeah. And this king is not doing it the right way. He's talking about being a sacrifice. He's mm. talking about destroying the temple. And these Pharisees are like, what's going on? This is not the king yeah. that we wanted. Yes. And Jesus, right after he rides into the temple in John's account, starts talking about the necessity of his death. He mm. must die. Right. And then it launches a whole string of arguments with the biblical scholars of their day saying, no, the Messiah can't die. Mm. That's not what the Messiah is supposed to do. So there is this long string of arguments that happen in John's gospel and all the other gospel writers as well about what is the nature of the Messiah? How has he come to rule the earth? Mm. Um, And Jesus says, I'm not coming the way that you expect. Right. Okay. I think I understand how all that's playing on the political and religious Mm. landscape of the day. Let's jump forward 2,000 years to those of us celebrating Palm Sunday today. Mm -hmm. And why is Jesus riding in on a donkey to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago? Good news for me today. I mean, the, the news that our kingdom, the one that we reside in, America, China, wherever, mm-hmm. is not the final or ultimate kingdom. Yeah. is pretty powerful good news. Mm. Um, I'm not ultimately a citizen of where I live. Right. Not ultimately at the whims of the powers that be that wield death. But I belong to a new kingdom with a king that is promised to rule by by and with and motivating through life-giving power mm. and promises life even after death. Yeah. Um, we know that what part of what that kingdom means is the working of smaller scale resurrections and new life, like yep. healing. I'm sure you guys can tell my voice is like yeah. not 100%, <laughs> but like part of the new kingdom is living in a world where God answers the prayers of people who are weak and failing mm. and heals people's bodies. Yeah. There's like a new order that is not the same or operates on the same principles as the place we currently live. Mm. And like, that's really good news. And we belong there and that is increasingly becoming a reality as we live. I think too, I'm hit with the good news of the the fact that Jesus is a king who comes. Yes. Right? That there's been all this expectation ever since and even before David yeah. of a king who would come and bring equity and peace and hope and harmony, uh, you know, it would actually rule well. Yeah. And, you know, they waited for it. Zechariah waited for it. Like the people of God were waiting for it in Jesus's mm-hmm. day. And then God becomes flesh. You know, that's, that's, the, yes. that's the Christmas story yes. that we celebrated a while back. And now in the Easter story, that God is coming to us to yes. rule us yes. as king And what kind of king is he? Humble and lowly, riding on a donkey. He's not a king like the religious establishment in Rome who will continue to try to preserve their power. But he's a king who comes ready to sacrifice his power for the sake of his people. Yeah, and that's the kind of king we need. (laughs) Yes, that's the kind of king we need. Yeah, that's good. I think as we close, I would say one other bit of good news that I can kind of see in this is 
the whether it was on purpose or happenstance the prayer that the people were praying over Jesus, yes. shouting over him as he arrived. Hosanna, save us, Lord, we pray. We can pray that right now, right? That's right. We can shout that out on Palm Sunday That's today, right. and Jesus answers that prayer. He comes to us just like mm-hmm. he came into Jerusalem. That's we right. can say, save us, God. We need you to save us. And Jesus comes. Yeah. He saves. He arrives. He rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's really good news that God answers our prayers and the way he answers them is with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, that's uh, Palm Sunday. That's Palm Sunday. What's tomorrow? Tomorrow is Holy Monday. Yeah. So Jesus has come in on a donkey and the first thing he does once he comes into Jerusalem is arrive at the temple and start. Well, first he made a homemade whip and then he started <laughs> turning tables over. Yes. So that's what happened. Cleansing of the temple, Cleans- turning over tables, whipping people. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Well, tune back in tomorrow, everybody, for Holy Monday. Thanks for joining us today and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Spoken Gospel Podcast. Spoken Gospel creates short films, devotionals, and podcasts like this one. Everything we make is free because of generous supporters like you. To see our resources, visit SpokenGospel.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening. See you next time.